No eye contact for you, mate. Exactly. We're going. That's fair. Tense up. Go, Godot. Brothers and sisters, welcome to Penn's Sunday School, starring Penn Gillette. My name is Michael Godot. Mac Donnelly, Penn and I, we're broadcasting from the show Creator Studios South here in Las Vegas. On today's show, we've tricked Professor Gary Martin from NYU into joining us. <laughs> He's a scientist, author, entrepreneur, and he'll be talking about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and we'll pretend to understand what he's saying. Here he is, preaching love, Mr. Ben Gillette. Yeah, our preacher love. We were in the middle of the uh, China Sea, middle of the China Sea, right? That is where we met. Going from, uh, going from uh, Kobe to, uh, to Shanghai. That and we actually walked around Shanghai we and did. destroyed uh, destroyed my lungs and my voice <laughs> walking around. But had a wonderful talk while we were doing it. It was wonderful great. Wonderful talk while we were doing it. And your book has come out called Rebooting AI, Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust, that you wrote with Ernest Davis. You did all the work, right? You I, just- I, I did the uh, writing and he did the... Uh, careful you, correction. Say, did you really mean to say that? He did a lot so of he, he, Totally bullshit. It's like Penn and Teller. You did all the work. The other guy just rides in your coattails, right? <laughs> Not exactly. He did something. He did something. But so very, which one are you, Mr. Very, very, <laughs> shut up. I, I am the taller one. I mean, You, I, you I, are? There you go. How's that possible? I'm not as tall as you, though. No, no, I could eat off your head. So, uh, so tell us about, uh, about, uh, AI and robots. You know, one of the things is I tend to be, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a pathological optimist and, uh, I get very, very excited when I would sit with Marvin Minsky and he would say that AI was 20 years away. I didn't even notice that it was 20 years from when he first said that, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that I, that I, when 2001, a space odyssey came out, it said in the advanced press materials when i was a child it said uh hal is 20 years away and then that was whatever 68 by uh 88 i was at mit at marvin minsky's house sitting with him and he said ai 20 years away and always will be it, it always will be 20 years away. Some people think the explanation for that, why for 60 years it's always been 20 years away, is that 20 years is exactly four or five grant cycles. So you can say, give me all this money, <laughs> and in 20 years you'll have it, but nobody's ever accountable. Yeah, it fades away from that. People have retired, right, that they, they gave you the money. In the, but yeah. isn't that, but in academia, there, there, there really isn't, how, uh, how result-oriented is it other than getting papers published? Well, I mean, there's academy now. Now there's industry. People want to make results, but they also want to keep their labs going. So, I mean, there's always a, I've got mouths to feed. I have graduate students to pay for, and so forth. It's motivating part of the prediction, and I think people are also gullible. So, um, one of the things we talk about in the book is what we call the gullibility gap, and it's great for your business because mm-hmm. I can or you can show somebody a little bit, and they will um, make a lot of inferences beyond the thing that they saw. But it's bad for evaluating artificial intelligence. So go back to Eliza, which you probably know Mm -hmm. from the early 60s. That was the first chat bot. And people would talk to it over teletype, which is sort of like text messaging. And they would think they were talking to a real person just because it said like two or three things that seemed intelligent and weren't actually intelligent. So you would say, you know, I'm having trouble with my girlfriend. It would say, oh, well, tell me more about your relationships. And it would just recognize the word uh, girlfriend and have the word relationships as a canned response. But our brains, I think, evolved to take little signs of intelligence and elaborate on them and think that there's intelligence there well, when it isn't really. So somebody you know, got into a Tesla, let it drive them around for a little bit and thought, this is cool. I, I can just watch Harry Potter here. And we all know what happened to that person, right? They wound up dead because they put too much trust in the end. But I mean, we have to also look at um, what percentage of uh, how many people are watching Harry Potter while they're, dr- while they're in their Tesla. It's more than one. Um, I mean, well, it, it, I mean, it, it threatens to be more and more. I mean, a whole bunch of people have fallen asleep in their Teslas on autopilot. Mm-hmm. Of course, some people fall asleep in their cars without autopilot. Um, right. But but there there and is a lot of, of the trust people, people who have fallen asleep. In I mean, we had this we had we had this discussion in the China Sea, where uh, where uh, how many people are dying in the auto accidents a year? Uh, what, Forty thousand in 40, the U.S. 000. or something like that. Forty thousand in the U.S. So if we had a system that made 39,000 
die a year. That's that's an improvement. Absolutely. I mean, something that not everybody realizes about this book is that not everybody gets past the first chapter is the first chapter is really, really dark. Mm-hmm. And the last chapter is really optimistic. That's true. And, and on- um, The same bullshit format we used on bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So we cut away the bullshit for the first, you know, 150 pages of the book and say, if you fix the problems that people don't even want to acknowledge, AI would be great. And one of the reasons it would be great is we do think driverless cars that are safe are possible. They're not possible now. We don't have the right technology to build it right now. What we're doing is much too much about statistics and not enough about common sense and understanding why people are driving and so forth. But in principle, for sure, driverless cars someday, could be 20 years or 50 years and not five, someday we'll cut down the number of deaths from 40,000 to like 4,000 a year. I mean, it'll be a really wonderful thing, and that's just the United States. But is that already happening? I mean- uh, No, what, it's not already happening. What I was, what I was trying to say, and I, 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 I didn't get it out properly, was uh, the image you get from the press is that uh, one dipshit started watching Harry Potter while his Tesla was driving- and he's now a dead motherfucker. That's what that's what it says. He's in the not a dipshit though. He's he has a very human um, right characteristic of being gullible. But what I'm saying is, of those gullible people, weren't there X number that we don't know people who did read watch Harry Potter while their car drove and got their okay. There may be a few, but I would say that the odds are not good. So, I mean, the best statistic we have right now is what is the inter- intervention rate for driverless cars? So that's how, uh, I mean, first of all, the name driverless car is bullshit, if I can use one of your favorite terms, sure. right? Because in, in the long run, they will really exist. There will be cars where you get in and it's like an Uber. You say where I'm going, where you pick me up, and it just takes you there. Mm-hmm. But right now, every time you read a media account of a quote driverless car, behind those quotes, there's actually a safety driver. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to read six paragraphs into the story about now driverless cars are in you know Arizona or whatever. There's always a safety driver. Right. And in those cars, we actually have statistics. And the best are they need an intervention about once every 12,000 miles, which sounds pretty good, but humans only have fatal accidents every 134 million miles. And a lot of those interventions, if there wasn't an intervention, somebody would wind up dead. Give, give those two numbers again. So there is an intervention. Somebody's got to touch the wheel. And the best, quote, driverless cars. 12,000 miles. About every 12,000 miles. That's Waymo has the best published statistics. Mm -hmm. And then the published statistics for humans are they have an accident, something like one, a fatal accident, every 134 million miles. So there's, there's a long way to go before the driverless cars are actually on a par with the people. Um, that's what that's that's six orders of magnitude. It's a lot of orders of magnitude. I I did a panel with Danny Kahneman, you know, system yeah. one, system two, that thing fast and slow, um, the other day, and w- the conclusion that we reached was basically humans are a low bar, but AI hasn't reached it yet. So there's nothing that says it's impossible to reach the low bar that people have set. I mean, certainly it is possible in principle to have vehicles that are better than people. But right now, the technology that we have doesn't support a superhuman performance for driving. It might on highways in good weather, but you have things like unusual conditions, even in good weather, like stopped emergency vehicles. Teslas have run into stopped emergency vehicles five times in the last year. They don't have that many miles. I don't know the statistics, but it's probably pretty bad. Um, So they run into fire trucks and tow trucks because the code doesn't recognize unusual circumstances. And if you put them where there was like sleet or something like that, they'd be in, in deep trouble. And when people announce they've got a driverless car, usually they'll like have it in some limited route where there's no left turns and you're not going to be dealing with New York City traffic or Mumbai traffic or anything like that. Right now, they work in limited cases and the Achilles heel for almost all AI that we have now, not any AI that we might ever build, but the AI that we have right now is it works for cases that have been carefully programmed in or for which there's a lot of data, but there's not enough depth of understanding there for the systems to cope with things that are outside the range of, the, of which they've specifically specifically been trained on. So if stopped emergency vehicles aren't what they anticipated, it doesn't work. With a guy who drove the, um, or whose car drove into a semi-trailer, I mean, what happened, um, that's the, the person, the Harry right. Potter case, um, You know, they apparently, I haven't seen proof of this, but I've heard it in the industry, um, the Teslas had a problem that they were slowing down every time they saw a billboard. So they basically said something like, let's ignore the upper half of the visual field because we don't want to stop every time, all the time, we're getting rear-ended all the time. Mm. And then the the trailer looked a little bit like a billboard. 
And that was two years ago. The same accident almost happened earlier this year in Florida. So it's not happened twice. It's hard to solve these problems right now, the weird cases. The, the systems that we have right now, especially the popular ones, are driven by something called deep learning, or at mm -hmm. least that's a big component. And all deep learning is doing is learning a lot of correlations. I see this pixels, I should do this thing. I should move left, I should move right, I should slow down. It's not at the level of understanding that a human has, which is more like, I see a vehicle that's doing something unusual, I should get out of its way. They don't have enough of a conception of what unusual is to, or even what to get out of the way is, um, to really be able to do the human thing. And so like a human could see a police officer with a hand lettered sign in front of a bridge saying, stop, the bridge is out. They could read, no machine right now can actually read really. Um, and they could figure out how to do something that was outside of their scope of experience. And the current machines can't really do that. We wrote the book in part as a kind of cautionary tale to get people to realize how limited current machines are relative to the amount of trust that we put in them, which is sometimes like we have them control our lives by driving us. You say in the book, uh, Logan Airport with no driver in any Boston weather or traffic condition, that might not be in my lifetime. That's right. That was a quote, actually, from someone, Toyota. So um, w I think it was Toyota. W what's happened in the driverless car business, and we think it's representative of other businesses, too, is there was a lot of enthusiasm earlier on. Like in 2012, driverless cars had first become legal in three states. I wrote a piece in the New Yorker about, oh my God, what happens if a driverless car encounters a school bus full of children going out of control? Should it save you or the school bus? Like in 2012, we all So thought, you're the one that started that. Well, a couple of us started around the same time. The yeah. Economist had it. Yeah. I had it. I hadn't read the them. trolley. The trolley. The, the trolley problem. We were all borrowing the trolley problems from flip a foot from the '60s, mm -hmm. adapting it to drive cars. I was one of the first people to do that. And when I did it, I had just gotten back into AI from cognitive science, which is my first field. And I thought they were going to come soon, I and mean, they were legal, and people were running them. Um, and then, you know, everybody thought they'd be here by 2019, and they weren't. Right. You know, we just have these prototypes that aren't trustworthy. So it's taken much longer but to build. I want to, I want to talk about the trolley. Pro I, I was going to go somewhere else. We'll, we got plenty of time. We'll get to everything. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get everything. We'll get to everything and we'll everything solve. And time. We'll solve Fix everything. Awesome. These two shows. It'll all be done. Meanwhile, I have. In uh, the second <clears throat> show, the first session, we'll. Yeah. I filed my. Lay out the problems and then we'll solve them. I filed my copyrights for the rut row automatic driving uh, <laughs> thing. Uh, we'll see um, a police car and go rut row. Okay, let's uh, let's stop, Gary, for a moment, and let's talk about uh, something else. I've been doing this, you know. I've been doing this. Uh, this thing, BetterHealth.com, is a way uh, to uh, get counseling help, okay. uh, therapist help, uh, electronically. Yeah. Uh, and I signed up with a therapist. I did. I've never used a therapist in my life. And you're and you're doing it now. I'm doing it. That's crazy. And uh, <laughs> they they team me up. That's crazy. They team me up that. with a counselor. And, uh, I, you know, she said, you know, what are you worried about? And I said, well, there's not much, but then I mentioned one or two things. She started digging in and gave me advice on stuff to do. And it seemed like it might be helpful. Might be a good thing. <laughs> Go good. Is there, is there something that interferes with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient. It is. Yes. I just text. I mean, I can set up to do face-to-face. -face I mean, um, you know, Skype or something. I don't yeah. know what they use for what the exact app is they use, probably proprietary. And uh, I can also do a phone call. But I can also just do text, much easier for me. Because I don't have to, I, finding a time when I get 10 minutes stuck on the phone is impossible. Right. But I can text in between stuff. And she's really smart and knowledgeable, and people know stuff about helping it. it I've been liking this. Um, get help on your own time at your own pace. You can schedule secure video, okay, or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist. Licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. Anything you share is confidential. If you're not happy with your counselor, you can get a new one. They asked me, you know, I was offended. Because I like my counselor, and I get this little note that said, if you're not happy with your counselor, we can get rid of her. I go, no! <laughs> 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states, available worldwide, four communication modes, tax, uh, text, chat, phone, and video. Start communicating on 24 hours. I did that, too. Available on desktop, mobile, web, Android, and iOS. 
S. And it is affordable. I went to look at how much it costs. Yeah. I had to check it out. Because they're giving I, it to us for two months. Well, or- yeah, but I mean, just, it, but I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, it's pretty affordable. I mean, it depends. It's a sliding scale sure. for what you want and stuff. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not supposed to give you the price. But I was surprised by how cheap it was. To tell you the truth, it's not a crisis line. It's just to work on your stuff that you're working on. Right. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Penn Sunday School listeners get 10 percent off your first month with discount code Penn. So why not get started today? Go to BetterHelp B E T T E R H E L P dot com slash Pen. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched to a counselor you'll love. It might even be my counselor. Who knows? That's betterhelp.com slash pen. I liked them. Okay. With age comes wisdom, but getting older can also be a downer in one area specifically. 40% of men by age of 40, by the 40, 40% of men by the age of 40 struggle from not being able to get and maintain an erection. Why do guys turn to weird solutions or do nothing when they can turn instead to medicine and science? Expensive pills, injections where no man wants to be an injection, wants to be an injection, wants to have an injection. Uh, I think uh, check out hymns. This is a way to, this is one of these ones you could spell a zillion ways. H I M S. <laughs> that's the hymns it is. One stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness. That's what they're calling it sexual, sexual wellness. wellness. Uh, it's like a euphemism like here and above. I was talking about erections. Um, <laughs> well known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions to help you combat ED. Mm-hmm. Prescription solutions backed by science and made more affordable, uh, see results where other treatments fall short, stop worrying about multiple in-office doctor visits, no painful injections like other treatments, real simple, real easy. It seems like if you want to play with this stuff, this is the way to do it, right? Yeah. Um, try HIMS H-I-M-S, today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to hymns.com slash pen. That's F O R. H I M S dot com slash pen for hymns dot com slash pen. Prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require an online consultation where the physician will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details and safety information. That could, this could cost hundreds if you went to a person uh, in person to a doctor's office or pharmacy. Remember that's for hymns dot com slash pen and for hymns is spelled F O. R H I M S for hymns. Check it out. What people, there's the gullibility gap. Yep. And there's also this the 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 other side, which I've not named in a clever way, the what if thing. You know, when we had when nuclear power, you know, when when the China syndrome came out. That movie. Um, a lot of people were saying, uh, but on nuclear power, how do we stop it from going to the middle of the earth and falling out in China and blowing up everything in the world and we're all dead? And they were not comparing the likely thing with nuclear power with coal, which is killing everybody all the time and maybe will uh, – coal could possibly do some really serious – global damage more than it already has. Mm -hmm. But there are people dying uh, from coal power every day, every hour, probably works out to every- Pollution and mining. Yeah, probably works out to every minute. Someone is dying directly from the problem with coal that would not be dying from nuclear. And what troubles me about um, the arguments, and I've already said this, I'm going to say it again. Uh, What troubles me about the arguments is that people can also imagine- problems that aren't likely. That's right. I have never, uh, I've been driving, you know, whatever, uh, over 50 years. And uh, no, that's not true. Over 45 years. And uh, and uh, I have never made a decision to go into a tree as opposed to a school bus full of children. <laughs> uh, I've never been given that decision. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I regret writing that piece. As actually. a matter of fact, <laughs> I haven't met one person, and it would come up, you know, when you're having, when you're having nachos yeah. with buddies. I, you know, I chose to crash into the tree. Yeah. 
I you do have be proud of that. <laughs> I do have a friend who once started a sentence in a way that really troubled me, and I still remember thirty years later um, from Western Massachusetts. And the sentence started: "The last time I ran into a cat." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have uh, my buddy Billy West, who once said when we had him on the show, the uh, the second time I flipped a car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that I just don't. Uh, what I read, and the gullibility thing is really important for someone like me who is so incredibly gung ho and optimistic. Um, it's really important. But I get so troubled when I read these articles. Uh, 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 against the kind of AI technology that come up with these very imaginative problems that I don't think are going to happen. We have so when you say stopped emergency vehicles and you say sleet, I'm listening to you. When you say busloads of nuns who are going to help refugee children, I go, I don't even know where those buses are. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a very low frequency problem. Let's say, and we actually write about this in the book. We say, everybody is worried about these trolley problems. We need to be worried about much simpler problems. Like mm -hmm. how do we teach a robot not to harm someone? So you could argue about Asimov's laws, but the first law, you know, first do no harm um, uh, is something that should be in robots in some form. You could say it should be a little stronger, also, or a little weaker. And we don't know how to program for doctors it. and they don't follow it. <laughs> they mostly do, but they not try. entirely. They try. They try. I mean, you Some could you could say you'd like <laughs> it to be an aspirational goal. That's fine. Um, and Asimov's books were about how sometimes there's tension and you can't quite follow it. But the, but say, point, is that the definition of harm is what makes it philosophical, right? That's why we're exploring it through science fiction first, right? Well, I, I would say that um, what's currently science fiction is the notion that a machine could actually understand that. So we don't have the ability to program that. So right now we can program into a machine how to recognize a bottle or a bottle cap or somebody's glasses, right. everyday objects, but they're all visual things. So you, you have a bunch of input data. This is a picture of what this looks like. This is what we call it. But you can't do that with harm. So you can't use that paradigm called the supervised learning paradigm, which is what's been blowing AI away right now. Um, you can't use that paradigm for harm. So you can't say like, here are 300 pictures and in these 300, there's a harm committed and 300, there's harm that's not committed and expect that it's going to understand the next picture and have any idea. So part of what we're pushing on the book is we need to change the paradigm of AI so that we can figure out a way to program in something like harm. Because if we are going to have robots or driverless cars that are having kind of a high impact on the world and are autonomous, not just automation like on an assembly line, but really governing our cars or taking care of people in elder care situations or whatever, they have to be able to recognize what is harm. So if I pour this boiling water onto somebody, is that going to cause them harm? You don't want to just have a picture of a, yes. a bucket of boiling water. <laughs> Good, you job, wanna... Good job, Pen. Good job, Pen. Pen is not a robot. I know some people may <laughs> want to <laughs> But we have just established that he is not. Breaking news. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I want to go to that. Uh, what was the big, you you know this, it must have been, uh, was it two years ago or something? The big uh, New York Times Magazine article on the- um, On the translation stuff. On the translation stuff. Talk about that. Well, I think it's cool, but it was also kind of- um, I mean, so the results themselves are cool. They, Google, first, I mean, give, give the background first. So, so what Google did- You'll do it better they, than I will. They, they took this new technique called deep learning, mm -hmm. and they did a better job with machine translation than mm -hmm. anybody had ever done before. So they already had Google Translate. They made Google Translate much better by using very large databases and this technique called deep learning. Um, but I think that the article, A, glorified things a little bit, made it sound like they had made more progress beyond uh, what they'd really done. In particular, they confused machine translation, which is actually a language task that doesn't really understand, doesn't require you to understand language, um, with other kinds of language tasks. So there's an old term called the fallacy of the composition, which is basically saying, if I show you X, you think it applies to X and Y and Z and so forth. You extend too broadly. So it turns out machine translation, the way that you can do it, is you can take bilingual texts or multilingual texts. You've got Harry Potter in two different languages, the French parliament um, or the Canadian parliament in two different languages. And it's just kind of a matching exercise, basically. Mm. You can do that without actually understanding the thing that you're translating. And I don't think the times um, went into that deep enough. Um, and so you can make imperfect translations. They're not 
great, but they're not terrible. You wouldn't use Google Translate for a legal contract. And it doesn't actually understand what it's translating. It's fine for what it is. If you want to know the gist of this article, was it positive or negative about me that you know people wrote this thing um, in, in Portuguese yesterday, you can kind of find that out. But it doesn't actually understand what's going on. And there's a huge, huge gap between being able to do that and making a machine that can understand a conversation. Now let's uh, let's really uh, this is this is a huge amount of your book. Uh, let's define understand. So understand. I mean, there's probably no perfect definition. But, no, no. But, but just for what we're talking about, for what we're talking about, it's that if I give you some text, you can tell me who did what to whom. You can kind of answer answer the journalist questions: who, what, where, where, when, why, and so forth. So you could say, you know, this character's motivation is this, or you could fill in things that were obvious but not spelled out. That's what understanding would be about. So you're not talking about anything metaphysical here at all. Nothing metaphysical, and Even I'm not slight. talking about like the kind of you know literary deconstruction. You can say, well, the author was intending to you know mm -hmm. pull this metaphor. I'm just talking about like the basics. I mean, one of the things reading comprehension at a high school level, reading comprehension even at a middle school level. Let's say. Well, you also talk about your children being ahead of AI. At Three, right? Two. That's right. Well, I mean, now they're 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 five and six. They're way ahead of AI. Mm -hmm. Um, in in some terms, not all. So, I mean, I'm not saying my six year old could beat the best Go program or the best chess program. It couldn't. But my either my five year old or my six year old could easily beat the best AI at reading a story and understanding like what the story is about and who did what to whom and why did they do it and what's the moral of the story and also i know you like this word they can play counterfactual games they can be like well what if instead they had wings would you know would this story have ended differently would they have been able to jump over the fence and escape or whatever so like my kids can contemplate not just what's written on the page but what might be implied or what could vary that now kind of those stuff. things that you have and I, this is one of the things uh marvin minsky and that gang kind of uh, stop the uh, the deep learning people from doing stuff. They had one way to do Society of Mind, that book, which I- Well, in his famous book, out. Perceptrons with, with Seymour Pepper, um, in the late 60s, kind of shut down the ancestors to deep learning. Part of the problem with AI right now is there's been bitter history. Marvin was part of that bitter history. Mm -hmm. So going back to the 50s, people tried to have the neural network approach, which deep learning has come out of, and the classic kind of logic and symbolic approach that Marvin was part of. Mm -hmm. And there were bitter wars. And Marvin looked at the ancestors to deep learning in 1969 or so, and proved that they couldn't prove that they were sound in certain cases. And mm -hmm. a lot of people stopped working on it. They lost grant money. I keep telling you how important grants are to academics. They got really mad, and they were really bitter. And now they're sort of on top but I think they're not as far on top as they think they are, and they're dismissing everything that Marvin ever did. They, do, they don't want to touch anything that Marvin did. And there's lots of stuff that Marvin did that I don't think holds the test of time, but some of the roots of what he did I think are important. So I think he was right, for example, about the notion of society of minds, that you want to have different agents that are doing different kinds of things as part of intelligence, because intelligence has many different factors. There's you know, the intelligence that's involved in, in being able to juggle, for example, you know, kinesthetic intelligence. Hey, we, he passes class. I, I, I pass clubs too. Clubs. We, we have many jugglers on set here. <laughs> um, it's a little tight in here for unicycle. It may be a very, like a 10 inch wheel. We could do something in the intermission. I'll see um, myself out. <laughs> so, so um, you know, there's kinesthetic intelligence, there's visual intelligence, there's social intelligence, so forth. There are many aspects to intelligence. Marvin said there's probably different systems for that. He's right. Whereas people right now are like, let me just get a big data set. Oh, I need a bigger data set. They just want like one algorithm to rule them all without thinking through that each of these problems are different. They, but, why, but why would we even want that? I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense to me that I want a Roomba, but I don't need that Roomba to also fly. You don't I don't need, need to, to go pick up pizza. You don't need your Roomba to fly, but I would pay a lot of money to have Rosie the robot that would be able to, um, you know, tidy the house, take care of the kids, and be versatile. What and I, I would pay a lot of money well, those for very, robot very I can different trust. systems. And that's like saying, you know, my 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 car doesn't work as a boat. You know what I mean? We can my make house, a car boat. My housekeeper. They're not good all, boats or ca our cars. You know my housekeeper I mean? can do all of these things. If I yes. could, if I could have a robot that could just do all the things that my housekeeper could do. That would be fabulous. But you could have you do 12 that, robots you do that all, do all the, those You do things. that all the way through. You talk about Maybe. the Rosie Robot thing. I mean, 
one thing my house can I, I, sure. I just want to really yeah. drill in onto this one um there are many things my housekeeper can do that no robot can do right so of course it's not just a matter of i could have 12 different robots and you know a certain sense i do already like i have my dishwashing robot already but take tidying the house which you know we have to do all day long we have two little kids there's no robot that can actually do that so Roomba can do the floors. And I should say, I just formed a company with the co-founder of Roomba. So I know mm -hmm. all about Roomba and the backstories right. and all sure. that kind of stuff. Um, so, but Roomba actually is, is a floor bound dweller, let's yes. say. It's not going to be able to pick up the bottles after a party and put them away. There's no robot that can do that. It's not that I could have but a robot could, to do that and a robot to do something else. Do you not believe that you could program one to pick up bottles after a a party though you know what i mean it, it's, it's pretty better. hard with current technology so my new company is trying to build software to make problems like that easier mm -hmm. but there is no current technology that can for example deal with bottles and different lighting conditions and different configurations different orientations on different tables the the, the system that we have right now are really inflexible that's part mm -hmm. of what um, the whole book is about so like there are demonstrations you can find these on the web of um PR2 is a particular robot getting a bottle out of a refrigerator and bringing it to somebody, but it will only work in that refrigerator if the beer is at the right height and the light is right and there's nothing on the floor. Um, there's no robot that can do that in a flexible way that way that you know any seven year old could do no problem. But we uh, not legally, but uh, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but uh, you you they. The thing is that we are, we can meet, we can meet and help the robots. And one of the things that your book hits over and over again is the, ro the robot um, uh, image going through and doing many, many things. But we do know that on factory floors, that when we make the space for the robot, robots can do astonishing things. I That's mean, right. They are at their best when we aren't around. Right. Right. So, and then second best at a situation like the um, Kiva robots that uh, Amazon has that they're yeah. basically like Roombas that move bookshelves yeah, to yeah. people. So those kinds of things, the more controlled the circumstance, the better. And what we explore in the book is essentially how is it that people can do what robots can't, which is to interact in environments that aren't that well controlled. How is it that we can think on the fly and deal with a situation where something pops up that isn't the, uh, ordinary. But there's also the argument we have to be careful of, which is the argument that the creationists use, what good is part of an eye? And the, the answer is, in this case, uh, part of an eye, it like is. in evolution, is really, really useful. Sure, sure. I, I mean, so what if you, uh, what if you uh, uh, postulated a, uh, a freeway going from L.A. to Vegas uh, that had a, uh, a, a train set on it that you could ride a bike to and that could be a robot that could uh i mean i, I guess all i'm doing is talking about a train um <laughs> i was about to say i mean we already have trains yeah. we have monorails yeah. i mean I, i'm not saying that the existing ai techniques are no good i'm not saying that no. you know two percent of an eye here is no good but i'm saying that people are confusing progress on these very narrow cases for progress on general intelligence. So sometimes people talk about artificial general intelligence, and that would be machines that can kind of do whatever we want. So Rosie the Robot would be an example, or the Star Trek computer would be an example. And it's interesting that they don't exist yet after six but isn't, years. But isn't, isn't Google search an example? No, Google search is actually pretty limited. So, I mean, Google search, I mean, it's super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, it's maybe the best example I can think of of a 2% of the eye that, that's mm -hmm. really good. But you could type in a question like we had one in our Times Up at, at the other day, which was, um, uh, did George Washington own a computer? I know. I love when you come up with those. Those are so good. You should that's put out what a, Ernie does, a whole book that just lays out those, those examples. All those great, great examples are, almost all of them are from Ernie. I had a good one about Spartacus in there, but most oh, of yes, them, yes. <laughs> that, that was a really good one. But, um, I was channeling my inner Ernie to bring yeah. that one out. Um, so, so he, he's full of examples like that. And the, the point of that particular one is unless there's a web page that actually gives the answer that George Washington didn't have a computer, Google's not actually smart enough to put the pieces together. So it finds pages that have the right keywords and it'll turn out if you have George Washington and computer that it's going to give you a, a piece about George Washington University's new computers mm -hmm. rather than answering the question, but did George about, Washington have a computer? Uh, you know, I, I, I think about, uh, this is a little bit like the argument of uh, the, the apocryphal story of uh, Bono, 
on stage saying, every time I clap my hands, a child in Africa dies. And someone in the audience yells out, stop clapping, you cunt. <laughs> uh, not true, but a wonderful story. Um, it's a great example of causal reasoning, which is something <laughs> we talk about. It's causal reasoning not working that well, but it is causal reasoning. Um, but when you have these examples of Google and AI not working, why aren't they just plugged in, those examples? Why does it Ernie sit and think of those examples for hours and type them all in and tell the computer, yeah, George Washington didn't know to come? Well, actually, Ernie has been sending those to a good friend of us who of ours who works at Google for okay. several years. And usually our good friend at Google kind of shrugs his shoulders or, or, you know, over the email virtually. Um, the problem is that it's like putting Band-Aids on. So mm -hmm. one example- Which works. Which works, but but it's like playing whack-a-mole, yeah, right? Which it, also works. It, no, whack-a-mole doesn't you really work moles. that well. You, yeah. you, you get, are hitting moles. You're hitting some moles, but they yeah. keep, keep popping up. So the, pro the problem is that the field doesn't have general solutions to these problems. So any one of them, it's pretty easy. If you want to just add a new fact into Google's library that George Washington, um, you know, didn't own a computer, you know, you can do it. You can fix that one. Um, and you can have like you know, millions of people putting fingers in dikes mm -hmm. um, indefinitely, but the systems themselves aren't smart enough to actually understand what it is that's trying to be fixed. And so it is just band-aids. What's happened with the driverless cars is people haven't been able to put the band-aids on fast enough. So, um, you know, people working in that business note the problems they put on the band-aids, but there's just more and more problems. And we aren't at a place where you can actually trust the machine because the number of problems far exceeds the number of band-aids that have been placed. But if we had, uh, for instance, a, uh, and I, I realize we're jumping around here, but who cares? Um, if we had a, a Tesla lane, self-driving lane, get terminology that everybody can agree on, an assisted driving la range, uh, lane. We'll call them a semi-autonomous vehicle yeah, lane. Yeah, semi-autonomous vehicle lane. And you could get in there, and there were also signals built in along there that if an emergency vehicle were going in, it automatically overrode it like like my the gates of my gated community open up for an ambulance automatically. That's technology we have. Mm -hmm. And it had it in there in sleet and stuff. And those cars could then be a foot apart and go 90, 100 miles an hour. Uh, and the person could be playing uh, Harry Potter and there's no steering involved. Couldn't you get a situation where somebody could get on a freeway in Nebraska and sleep and work and talk on the phone and fuck and do whatever they wanted in their car and at least do four hours? Yeah, I, I think that's totally feasible. Right, so um, you it's not going to help you with Manhattan or Mumbai, but yeah, um, I, I think in fact that the first real commercial uses of driverless cars um, or drive, autonomous uh, driving will be uh, trucks. Mm -hmm. So you'll have maybe someone who can sleep. And they have to be awake for the little hard parts at the end, mm -hmm. which is not that much of the driving. The most of the driving is monotonous highway driving. The real problem is the driver falling asleep. It's not weird circumstances. Um, it has to be really good in the sense that a truck is a pretty big vehicle. And if it does run into a tow truck, it's going to cause a lot more damage yeah. than if a Tesla does. So um, there are still some special cases, even on the highways, that need to be solved. But that will be, I think, the first commercial use. Yeah, every time I sat around with your book, Thinking about uh, how 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 uh, autonomous cars could be solved, I just came up with reinventing trains over and over again. That's right. There's a right. continuum from airport monorails, which we've had for like 40 years, mm -hmm. that are completely um, autonomous, to what you would need to deal with Manhattan. And but we I mean, can move along amazing. that continuum. We should use trains more. That's all I read. Yeah, when, we could rebuild here, here. Manhattan <laughs> in a way that makes it work. Like you could design your home well, to that's, fit first, a Roomba into every corner. First thing, we need alleys to put the trash out when we redesign Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we put it all up three feet up, <laughs> put a grid under it. Which is something that but, sucks uh, out the trash. But, but but look, I mean, there, there's two arguments to be had. One is, can we find some use from the somewhat half-assed AI that we have now? And the answer is yes. And relatively soon, we'll be able to do the thing about helping truck drivers. 
Mm-hmm. And the other is, are we actually going to get to AI that's as smart as Hal or the Star Trek computer or Rosie the robot? And why haven't we after 60 years? I mean, think that the, in terms of orders of magnitude, how many orders of magnitude more memory our computers have than they did 60 years ago? How much more data we have? How much faster they are? And it becomes an inte- interesting intellectual question of why haven't we made that much progress? We have exponential progress in playing chess and Go, all these board games. And then we have almost no progress on natural language understanding or the resourcefulness for a robot to deal with the real world. As a, uh, as a lay person who, when a, uh, an AI article pops up in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a media for a regular person who reads most of that, that's the level I'm at. There's all of these um, uh, like half-assed stories I've come into. And what I want to do here is not so much a, an argument as to just have you explain a bunch of stuff that I understand half-assed that you understand really well. Go for uh, it. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here, here's a few of the stories that I have in mind. Now, there's all these uh, YouTube, <clears throat> excuse me. Getting choked up with emotion. There's all these YouTube uh, videos of the, what's called the dreams of computers mm-hmm. that they've put together. Uh, this is every way a cat would look when they put together the uh, the the Google photo recognition is uh, to my mind very good. It is to very my good. mind, almost supernaturally good, and the face recognition is kind of crazy good. It makes mistakes all the time. But boy, when it doesn't, it's yeah, it's pretty. So do I. <laughs> it, it does baseball hats. Well, really. I mean, it makes weird errors that you wouldn't like well, confusing. Uh, they'll sometimes confuse a mother and a child, and like you wouldn't make that particular confusion because you'd realize right. that they're you know thirty or forty years. But apart. what? And I, I, uh, I think we, I think we talked. You know, my, I want to give credit. My friend, my friend Rob Pike said that um, the problem with deep learning, as he saw it is when something goes wrong, nobody in the world knows what it is that went wrong. That's right. They're prone to very weird errors. They remind me of Oliver Sacks. So like I like to show when I'm giving a talk, a picture of a parking sign with stickers and the deep learning system says a refrigerator filled with food and drinks. And it's just like so bizarre. It's like, where did that come from? And And often there is an answer in part, but it's thinking about things in a totally different yeah, what, way. Yeah, what, 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 what Rob, thinking at all. What, um, what Rob said is that those mistakes that are so cute and so funny, oh, it thought this rowboat was a cat, uh, are not cute and funny because nobody really knows how to fix it. That's right. Nobody knows how to fix it. I mean, we're suggesting that the only way to fix it is to actually blow up the paradigm. So Mm -hmm. the paradigm right now is you have a lot of statistical data, pictures and labels, but no comprehension underlyingly, let's say, of what an animal is. So another example I like to show is an elephant in silhouette that a deep learning system calls uh, a person. And why does it do that? Well, these systems actually care more about texture than the things that things are made of. So you know that an elephant has a trunk and that that trunk is important. Um, You don't care so much about the texture of the skin, although you care some. When I show you the silhouette, you can't see the textures of the skin. But if you can see the trunk, you still know that it's an elephant because you understand that Mm -hmm. the trunk is important to being an elephant. You have a functional understanding of what an elephant Mm -hmm. does, what its parts contribute to its basic elephantness. And the deep learning system just skips all that. So what's going on? I'm I'm asking you not uh, an argument, but I'm asking you, I watched a few of those videos and I thought they were just some of the most beautiful, trippy uh, things I'd ever seen. I thought they were gorgeous and I felt like I was learning an awful lot about how deep learning worked, but I couldn't articulate it. What's going on there? They've, they've got a billion pictures of cats and this is what the computer generates as what it's learned from all those First, cats? I'm going to tell you, it's always cats. There's a lot of cat oh, yeah. videos on YouTube. <laughs> um, someone actually is keeping track. There's like a list of cat references in academic papers, and it's very, very long. <laughs> so, you know, you want to know, does it work with guitars too and not just cats? Right. Something like that. <laughs> okay. um, Will a robot it, chase a laser across a wall? <laughs> <laughs> so, so putting that aside... What deep learning really is good at is visual texture. 
And these things, Deep Dream and, and yeah. Inception Architecture and so forth, they're, they're playing around with the ability of deep learning to get the low level textures of what things are made up of and to twist and, and transform those things. So that's actually in the sweet spot of what it can do. It can't necessarily do it in a guided way, but you as the external person can place an interpretation on it just the same way if you were doing lsd and you had lava lamps you could be like wow that's cool it's not like there's any intelligence to the lava lamp but you have your psychology of, of how things look in the real world and you can relate what you see to something in your inventory of knowledge it was really showing me um a different way to look at cats you know a, a different way from my recognition it really seemed it really seemed like, uh, and I don't want to use any of the, any of the trigger words that'll get you fighting mad because I don't believe them also. Um, but there was a way it's interesting that when I look at a guitar and I recognize that as a guitar and then, um, Google images looks at, uh, a hundred million guitars and then shows me what it thinks a guitar is, it gives me a really different perspective on how I define a guitar. And I thought that was really rich and a certain kind of profound thing. If someone had done that in art, I would have felt like it was an expansion of the way I label things. I mean, I have no problem with that, other than to say, like, it still doesn't really know what a guitar right, is. Exactly. It doesn't really understand well, that was, if a string avoided, is broken and what I play. avoided all those words. I, I know you I did. avoided all of them. Now, but but then you're at the confusion of what knowledge is. You know, does it know what a guitar is? No, it doesn't know what a guitar is. But can it recognize a guitar? Well, it, and, it, it and, can and the idea that it's ever going to know what a guitar is because my, a bird doesn't know what a guitar is. Well, my point about the elephant case mm. um, is that it doesn't really know what an elephant is, even right. after you've shown it like a million pictures of elephants. It doesn't really know what an elephant is. Another example I like it doesn't is, know what an elephant is the way you know what an elephant is. It doesn't really know. But it might know, know what an elephant is in the way that you don't know what an elephant is. No. Now, what it, what it are knows, there examples what it knows. Of, of a computer being able to recognize something that a human would not? There must be, right? There must be the reverse example of the elephant person thing. So, so the examples that you will find is um, a deep learning system can, for example, learn to um, discriminate different species of birds or dogs better than a human would. And also there's some some work with tumors, right? And some work with reading x-rays. Yeah, a lot of that is kind of lab demonstration stuff. Like it, it will eventually happen that we can use this stuff in clinical practice. We can't really yet. Right now what happens is people get some data set, they train very well on that data set, but they can't deal with the real world where like slides are um, sometimes not taken quite properly. And, but if, and we have, if we have data sets where um, um, the computer is just marginally better we do. than a radiologist at telling what a tumor might be, uh, then that working together, you with can actually person. get advantage with a person. Yeah. yeah. So there will definitely be in the next, let's say 10 years, maybe the next five, um, places where the nature of the radiologist's job actually changes. Mm -hmm. So part of what a radiologist does is kind of like Sherlock Holmes. They like read the case history and they figure out, oh, this relates to this accident this person had 20 years ago. And that requires reading, which current AI just doesn't really do. And there's part that's just looking at pictures. And the part that's just looking at pictures, that's deep learning's sweet spot. So the thing deep learning can do best and that AI right now can do best is really about classifying pictures. It's not perfect. I gave you the elephant example. I could give you dozens more, but if things are in their usual boundaries and they're not weird, so it's a silhouette of an elephant is weird. Um, if they're just kind of ordinary garden variety stuff, then deep learning doesn't have problems of falling asleep or checking its email but or also, text aren't and can do better. Aren't the reciprocals also true? Like there may be, if, if we're looking for a certain shape, of a tumor that is cancerous and one that is not. And I'm talking about something I don't understand at all. Uh, but we're looking for that, that, that difference. Uh, isn't it not only possible, but likely that you have the elephant human example in reverse with a computer going, obviously this is cancerous and this is not. Right. And people there, can't see there it. Maybe I, I think 
you could look at the literature now and squint your eyes and say maybe there's some examples. Eventually, there'll be more and more of those mm -hmm. examples. But uh, again, the the advantage of the machines as currently constituted is more going to be like on the ordinary cases on which it has a lot of data, it's going to be more accurate than the person. The person is just going to blow it some of the time. Mm -hmm. It's like you know on arithmetic. If I have a you know smackdown with my calculator, my calculator is always going to win. I know the rules of math, but sometimes I forget to carry the one. And, yeah. and you know, there, there's no case where the computer understands arithmetic better than I mm -hmm. am, but it's going to be more accurate. But the if a radiologist, if there is a visual tumor detecting calculator that the radiologist goes to, that is a huge use for AI that actually saves lives. Yeah, now my radiologist friends are not that impressed except for the following case, which is there are places in the world where there aren't enough radiologists. Mm -hmm. And we will definitely have kind of radiology reading by a cell phone. It won't be perfect, but it'll be pretty good and it'll be pretty cheap. And that will be transformational for many parts of the world. How soon machines will actually be better than radiologists when you account for everything a radiologist has to do? I don't know. How soon they'll be an adjunct? I think that will happen relatively soon. But, you know, uh, like we had uh, the people at NASA, the mostly women, who were called calculators, who did just the absolute arithmetic that had to be done and did it very, very well and did it constantly. That whole thing was replaced by computers very successfully. If we can do that in hunks of, of the world, we get we get much more efficiency and much yeah, more. Yeah, I money. think radiology is, is the first place where AI is gonna have a significant life-saving impact. Um, there are other parts of medicine that are still far outside of our reach, but that one is within our reach. I mean, the, the larger point is that when we do intelligent things like medicine or just cleaning our rooms, there are parts of it that are very visual and there are parts that require us to reason and have inference mm -hmm. to, and so forth. And AI right now is very good at the visual side of things, not perfect. And I could give you lots more examples where they fail, but they're we pretty do good like, at We that. do like those examples where they fail. I'll, let me, I'll, throw, <laughs> I'll give you just one we're gonna, more. We're going to end with a couple examples of them failing, and then we're going to do a, a whole other show where we're going to solve everything. Awesome. Now that we've set out the problem. So, so give me, give us a couple good examples. Um, there's a picture I often show of a snow of, sorry, of a school bus on its side on a snowy road. And the deep learning system says with great confidence, snow plow. You and I look at this and we're like, what? There's no plow there. How did it come up with that? And it's a proof that the systems mostly rely on texture instead of functional understanding. So they rely on the texture that snow plows are usually on snowy roads and this particular school bus is on a snowy road. So it's confusing the snowy road with, with the thing that's on it. Um, another example is a baseball with foam on it. Deep learning system says espresso because it cares about the <laughs> texture of the foam and not the underlying object. <laughs> Does it, is it espresso foam? It's espresso foam on a baseball. <laughs> or at least it looks that way to me. I don't drink coffee, so you should really ask an expert. <laughs> okay, we're going to come back, do a whole other show on Wednesday with Gary Marks. But for right now, that was Penn Sunday School. That was Penn Sunday School. Cha-cha-cha. And to our You become naked. Give us some more of those uh, Ernie questions. You got more? Just bang out. Ernie examples? I mean, yeah. th that wasn't an Ernie example. Um, um, I mean, in some ways, the best example is that Almanzo story that we go through in a lot of that. Give us an So, um, my, my favorite Ernie example is going through an entire story by L Laura Ingalls Wilder, a children's story, and showing that a nine-year-old can infer things that no deep learning system could dream of. Well, we'll get back. We'll do more of that on Wednesday. The Ingalls test. We love you. <laughs>